Okay, so now that we've talked about and solidified to a degree cardiac myocyte physiology, um, I'm going to go through really, really, really briefly uh, everything that we went over in the past week through maybe three lectures. We've got uh, this guy here, which you may remember from the quiz or you may foreshadowing for the quiz. This is a uh, pacemaker cell. This is the potential changes of a sinoatrial node, for example, pacemaker cell. Right, so that's a pacemaker cell. You have this slow depolarization caused by funny current channels, and then you have voltage-gated calcium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels here, and then that continues all the way down, and you get a rebound with your funny current channels. The uh, intracellular levels of cyclic nucleotides, CAMP specifically, can modulate the leakiness of these funny channels. So what you're doing is you're modulating the length or the slope of this line, say with epinephrine, it's going to reach threshold quicker, which speeds up the heart rate. Epinephrine does a number of other things. It can increase con contractility. Um, it can uh, decrease the permeability of uh, potassium channels. So this doesn't go down quite as low. So there's lots of changes. But for the purposes of this class, really remember that the funny current channels are also uh, what we call CNG channels or cyclic nucleotide gated channels. You also have the contractile cells, and remember you have this calcium mediated plateau here. And that's what makes the action potential last as long as the contraction. The contraction is gonna look something like this. The contraction force. Therefore you can't get summation and importantly can't get tetanus in cardiac myocytes like you can in skeletal muscle cells. There's all that stuff. Here's the uh, acetylcholine and uh, norepinephrine effects. We went through all that with this pacemaker cell, adenylocyclase, increases or decreases in CAMP. Now, we talked about the Uyghur's diagram as well, right here. Electrical activity pressure, and then volume of blood in the ventricle. Goes up, comes down when it contracts. So all of that primes us to talk about cardiovascular physiology. But first, what we have to talk about is blood vessels. You have multiple layers in a tube, and this is a cross-section of a blood vessel. Tunica intima. And this is epithelial tissue. It uh, absorbs and secretes, and it monitors levels of uh, substances in the blood, and it can secrete materials into the blood. This guy out here is the tunica adventitia. And adventitia is just another name for connective tissue. So it's really fibrous connective tissue. The Or you might see this called the tunica adventitia. Externa. You may also see this called the tunica interna. In clinical settings, they're often called the externa and interna. Uh, scientists, biologists call it the intima and adventitia to reflect its histology. But this one, there are two names for this one also in the middle, this dark red here. This is also a tunic, tunica medialis. Or you can also call it the tunica muscularis. This right here, uh, this right here, and this right here just reflects its location in the blood vessel. The adventitia intima and muscularis talks more to its uh, histology. And the tunica muscularis is made of uh, muscle as the name would imply, and it is smooth muscle. 
Now that's why we're really going to cover smooth muscle here because the tunica muscularis can flex and what that's going to do is take a blood vessel from this big down to this big. And remember when we talked about flow, flow is volume per time, velocity is particles per time or parts per time, and then pressure increases with increasing resistance. And what you're doing, if you decrease the diameter, you increase the pressure and decrease the flow. Okay, So you can decrease the flow, but you increase the pressure. So if flow doesn't go down, pressure is going to go way up. So smooth muscle, if we just talk very generally about smooth muscle for a moment, smooth muscle is found in almost all tubes in your body. The urethra, the trachea, the esophagus, the rectum. Uh, what's another tube? The ureter. The uh, uterus. The fallopian tubes. I could go on and on and on all of the tubes, but important to this part of the lecture arteries, veins, possess lots and lots of smooth muscle. So if we take a look at this picture here, we've got your intima, muscularis, and adventitia, here called medialis and externa. Um, but these are arteries that take blood away from the heart and veins that return blood to the heart. Now they both have smooth muscle to modulate the diameter. And the main thing is modulating the diameter of the lumen where the blood flows this part I blackened in right here. Right? Now, some smooth muscle is what we call phasic smooth muscle. I'm going to start abbreviating smooth muscle SM just because I'm going to write it a lot. Now, phasic smooth muscle is like all of, or almost all of the smooth muscle in the vascular system. It's typically relaxed, but when it's stimulated, it contracts. So it contracts, closing down the lumen. The converse of that is tonic smooth muscle. Tonic smooth muscle is always flexed. And it needs to be stimulated to relax. Okay? So it's stimulated to relax. An example of this would be the anal sphincter. Right? It's thankfully in the basal state, always pinched shut. And then we get stimulation from the parasympathetic nerves for it to open up. In the uh, vascular system, an example of tonic smooth muscle is the precapillary sphincters. see a theme going on here. Most sphincters are tonic. Those precapillary sphincters are always contracted until they get stimulated to relax. And what stimulates these to relax, and we'll see this when we talk about cardiovascular physiology and the respiratory system, those muscles are stimulated to relax 
by uh, high levels of carbon dioxide and low levels of oxygen, which makes sense. If tissue has a buildup of carbon dioxide, they need more blood, right? They need more oxygen flowing to them and more blood to take away the uh, waste materials. So then those precapillary sphincters are going to open up. Now another distinction between uh, smooth muscle cells is single unit versus multi unit smooth muscle and single unit smooth muscle act I guess we should say the cells act together this would be akin to the cardiac myocytes all the cells are joined by uh, gap junctions And when one of them contracts, all of them contract. They act all together. Now, this is very typical of the uh, GI tract and of the cardiovascular system. Now, it's not that all of the cells in the cardiovascular system, but in a region, if your carotid artery contracts, the entire carotid artery is going to contract. Now contrast that with multi-unit. The cells act or contract independently. Now these are these multi-units are typical of the iris in the eye and the uh, uterus. And an interesting thing is with high high levels of oxytocin, the uterus switches to single unit. And it's an interesting thing how this can happen. You have this uh, uterine cell. I'm going to draw a representation of a tiny bit of the uterus here with a few of these skeletal muscle cells. And this is a multi-unit piece of skeletal muscle tissue. When oxytocin binds at high levels, oxytocin, 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 oxytocin. So you have lots and lots of oxytocin stimulating these receptors, and you need really high levels to stimulate to this intensity. <coughs> you get a downstream cascade, G protein, and a downstream cascade that increases the transcription of gap proteins. Does that make sense? So, when you have really, really, really high levels of oxytocin, that causes a downstream effect of increasing the transcription and translocation of GAP proteins into the cell membrane. And when do you have really high levels of oxytocin? Binding to your uterus at parturition. So, parturition... You get lots and lots of oxytocin. You also get some prostaglandins. I think it's PG2 alpha. Um, you also get lots and lots of progesterone or P4. And all of this taken together equals a single unit smooth muscle tissue in your uterus. So that when your uterus now flexes, it all flexes together and pushes the little baby out. Why? Okay, so then you get a nice big-eyed baby coming out of your uterus and birth happens. And that's because oxytocin has that effect of turning multi-unit smooth muscle tissue into 
single unit smooth muscle tissue. That's just so cool. Okay, so back to the cardiovascular system. Let's take a look here. Different from skeletal muscle. And this is to say the things that smooth muscle has or these are characteristics of smooth muscle. No distinct optimal length. If you remember when we talked about skeletal muscle, you crouch down and get your uh, skeletal muscle sarcomeres or cardiac muscle sarcomeres into an optimal length. And they are all lined up if you remember that uh, little picture of the sarcomere, you've got your thick filaments and then your thin filaments interspersed. And there's an optimal length which uh, maximize, it doesn't maximize, but it uh, maximizes the effective zone of overlap to where it's just, the actin is just all the way touching all of those myosin heads or in line with all those myosin heads. Smooth muscle doesn't have that. There is no optimal length, really, because there is no uh, sarcomere. And I'll just write no sarcomeres here because this is a important thing. We covered it earlier, but it has no sarcomeres, which leads to a lot of the differences. So there's no uh, direction. to the uh, myosin actin uh, filaments. And that is to say in, uh, I'm going to draw that picture again, in um, skeletal muscle, you have everything going on the longitudinal axis. Here's your Z-line here your M line right here. So everything is really lined up in a longitudinal direction. Right. So this is skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle, striated muscle in general. Smooth muscle is different. Smooth muscle, you've got these really long fibers, and you're going to have myosin motor proteins scattered throughout, and then you have actin that's associated with them, but there's no real direction, so when they contract, and they contract in a similar way to the sarcomeres, what happens in a similar way in that the myosin just ratchets down the actin binding to the myosin binding site on the actin, on the globular actin, but it's, it's different. It's not really organized. So what's going to happen is this, is, or I'm sorry, this smooth muscle cell is going to go from something that looks like that to something that looks like this, where you've got everything just really, it decreases in diameter, decreases in length, decreases in depth, decreases along every axis that you can think of, which allows it to really get small and really contract in every single direction, which is important because when smooth muscle contracts, it needs to contract all together, not just in one direction. Like take your bicep, for example. It's just pulling your hands up towards your shoulders. One direction. Even something that's multi-directional, say your pectoralis major, it is a uh, divergent muscle, but, or you could say convergent muscle, that goes from a really broad place on your sternum to a really uh, small place on your humerus. But each individual muscle fiber only contracts in one individual direction. Smooth muscle doesn't do that. It contracts in many, many different directions. Each individual muscle cell contracts in different directions. Now, while 
These do, the smooth muscle does have myosin and actin. They're different what you call isoforms, which are slight variations in the proteins. The myosin is a different isoform that is much slower. And one of the reasons it's much slower is myosin ATPase has slower kinetics, or just meaning that it moves much more slowly. You also have slower calcium ATPase in the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this leads to extended flexion of the muscle. Because if you think about it, once calcium enters the sarcoplasm, it stays there a little bit longer because it's not sucked right back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. A couple of anatomical differences. Um, there's uh, fewer mitochondria. There's no motor end plate. Remember, there's no motor end plate in uh, cardiac muscle either. But, so leaving the uh, skeletal muscle as the only type of muscle that has a synaptic connection, which is what this uh, motor end plate is. They are mononucleate. something they have in common with cardiac muscle, but that's different than skeletal muscle. And the nervous system that interacts with smooth muscle is the autonomic nervous system. And just like with um, cardiac muscle, there is sympathetic and parasympathetic form varicosities. So they form varicosities and those varicosities look something like this. Um, you've got your smooth muscle. I'm going to draw a number of cells here. Right. So here's your smooth muscle cells. And the autonomic nervous system doesn't come in and have a end plate like this or a synapse like this or even a bouton, really. What happens is your um, neuron comes by and there are varicosities, meaning kind of enlargements that are full of neurotransmitter. Now, if it's the sympathetic nervous system, it's norepinephrine. If it's the parasympathetic nervous system, it's acetylcholine. But just like in any neuron, the action potential travels down. And as it reaches here, you have voltage-gated calcium channels, and those voltage-gated calcium channels are going to open, allowing calcium in these uh, vesicles full of neurotransmitter are then going to bind with the membrane and release norepinephrine or acetylcholine, depending on, on if it's the uh, sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system. And it's how the autonomic nervous system innervates smooth muscles.
So it's just a different uh, setup within smooth muscle. So looking back inside, actin to myosin ratio, 10 actins for every myosin. Now in skeletal muscle, it's about 3 to 1. So you have many more actins per myosin in smooth muscle. Each myosin is surrounded by about 15 actins. And the reason that this number is different than this number is because you're going to have a myosin here, and then you've got about 15 around it, but then you're going to have another myosin here that shares some of those actins. So that's why each myosin is surrounded by 15 actins, but the ratio isn't 15 to 1 because some of the actins are shared. Calcium, and this is hearkening back to cardiac muscle. In smooth muscle, remember everything I'm writing in red here is in smooth muscle. In smooth muscle, calcium comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, just like in every other type of muscle, but also from the extracellular fluid. Now, this is unlike skeletal muscle, but similar to cardiac muscle. Now, the smooth muscle, this is distinct about smooth muscle. There's no troponin. And even though it has tropomyosin, it does not cover the myosin binding site of actin. So tropomyosin is present, but it's not the regulatory element that we saw in all striated muscle, or cardiac and skeletal muscle. It's there. It kind of wraps around. It's associated with nebulin. It's associated with actin, but it's not involved in uh, muscle contraction. So here's a representation of smooth muscle. Taking a closer look, you have these little things here called dense bodies. And these fill the function, basically, of the Z-line. In um, sarcomeres, they hold the actin. This uh, fiber here is holding on to other dense bodies, but also holding on to the actin molecules. And all of this is the cytoskeleton. I'm not going to be able to draw it in there, am I? Um, so this is the cytoskeleton. And you've got your dense bodies right here. that are just huge protein conglomerations that are holding everything together and holding things to the cell membrane. And then the cell membranes are attached to each other in a smooth muscle by connective tissue, just by uh, elastin many times. There's a lot of collagen in here. And then you have your myosin molecule here that goes all the way down. And you can see the actin looks basically the same. There's a myosin binding site. There's an actin binding site on the myosin. They grab. As soon as they grab, they go weep and do a little flexion thing. Okay. Now, the regulation of this is a bit different. It does rely on calcium, but remember, troponin is not present. And tropomyosin, though it's present, it doesn't cover up anything. It's not involved in the regulation of... Uh, smooth muscle contractions.